and we will get this recorded for everybody uh, I had to make sure. I know we had a few that uh, were concerned about uh, not being able to be here today and they wanted to make sure they had the recording. So I will make sure that that is the case. Um, chapter 14 and 15 really a lot of it lends itself to uh, more so being in the problems uh, rather than, you know, the content of the workbook. Um, you know, uh, depreciation is a hard teach. Um, you know, it's a, it's a concept that uh, for a lot of people is very difficult. I know my in-session classes uh, were actually taking an extra day. Um, just to kind of cover depreciation and do some exercises, if you will. Um, so, you know, it, it just, uh, it kind of gets us to that point. Um, you know, either you get it and you understand it, or it just, you know, you never grasp it. Um, and I'm hoping that I can simplify it best as I can uh, so that you guys can walk away and say, yep, I get it. I understand now. So. But uh, we'll kind of talk about uh, you know some of the things that go on with that, and we'll do some of the problems. And like I said, once we get into the software, sometimes it's much easier to see it in action than it is to uh, actually um, do it uh, the other way. So let me get the textbook up here. I had it up to save it, and somebody closed it on me. So let me get that up there so that we can share that and then we can talk real quick and then we'll go through some of the exercises. So actually, even though there's more content, we may be a little shorter on time today as far as the length that we'll go through things. So, okay. All right, one more chapter here. Okay. Uh, well, before I do that, um, we do have one more logistical thing that we need to talk about. Um, that is the final. Um, the way the final works and the way I've done it in the past, and, and I will be sending out an email to the entire class, so I hope that everybody's been getting those emails, but uh, the way the final works, you know, if you look at the itinerary in the class syllabus, is uh, um, next Saturday we do um, a lot of the uh, final wrap up talking about healthcare and amended returns and things like that. But I'll be sending out an email probably not till tomorrow. I actually am uh, going to be as soon as we're done here this evening. I have a fourth birthday party for my grandson. Um, it's actually a monster truck party, so I'm pretty excited. But uh, so I'll probably send out the email tomorrow. Um, that we'll have that and um, as it says there that uh, we'd like you to come into the office uh, our corporate office at uh, Colvin Boulevard and uh, to do your um, final you know we have the computer lab here so we'll probably schedule that uh, through this week and the beginning of the following week obviously I'd like to get it all done for everybody so you don't have to worry about it uh, as we approach the holidays but uh, the final is, is really something for those that uh, especially plan to work for us. Uh, we'd like to have you come in to do the, the return uh, here in the office. Um, you know, not that you're gonna be timed or anything like that, or that we're gonna be looking over your shoulder. Uh, but for me, it's, it's, it's great too, because uh, you know, I can kind of know what happened uh, on the, um, uh, to your return in the final. Uh, just based on the errors and the mistakes and the numbers that I would see on the printouts, the PDFs. Uh, but to not be able to see the actual return in the computer sometimes is tough uh, when you're seeing how people do. Um, you know, I look at the, you know, and, and try to focus what I talk about based on what I see from the homework and the problems that come in. Um, try to, de to decide what I'm going to talk about and emphasize uh, based on what I see in the PDFs. But again, I'm just not seeing, um, you know, the actual tax return to be able to know, you know, uh, what box, where did you click this? Where did that go? Because some of the stuff that, that is on the computer when we talk about some of these worksheets and some of the other things that we may talk about today, 
you know, they just don't print out with what comes in. So I don't see them. And, and sometimes I don't see the state side and there's a lot of things that are very important on that side as well. Um, we will have some things, I know some people get concerned, but you know, even prior to the uh, time that you, um, you know, start in the office, you know, there'll be a time when you do come in anyway, after we talk about employment to you, that you'll come in and you'll do a, uh, you know, we'll do an interviewing skills, if you will, or, or type of thing where we sit with you a little bit more and sit with you face-to-face, one-on-one to be able to spend time with you, you know, doing the return with somebody sitting across the desk from you and, and teaching you some of those other skills and fine-tuning the things you do uh, within the software, okay? But yes, I'll be sending something out. I'll be, have some times. Um, it used to be that uh, we were pretty limited, but now with our new corporate office and having a computer lab with several computers in there, you know, time to come in is pretty wide open. Um, I have times that, uh, you know, are, are towards the, um, um, you know, the end of the, uh, the day. So we're always good there too. So, all right. Um, let me just get something set up here. Okay. All right. Let's see here. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to get into uh, this is uh, part two of the business income. Um, if you remember from uh, last time, uh, we talked about uh, really the gross income. Uh, we talked about, uh, you know, if we had inventory, uh, we had cost of goods sold. Uh, we talked about uh, all the items that would be expenses. Um, we talked about, um, you know, the different things that would go into the return. Um, as far as uh, the expenses, we talked about some home office things. Um, and again, with what we're going to do today with the uh, problems, um, we will kind of expand a little bit more on that. I'll talk more about that uh, when we go to do the problems that we're going to do, because uh, really the problems, uh, 13 and 14, um, 14's problems really are just 13's problems, but we're adding depreciation. Uh, so we will do one of the problems that we have in there. Um, we'll talk about the things that you can do with depreciation, especially when you're talking about a tax return that may have a balance due uh, depreciation and using special depreciation or the section 179. And I hope that uh, those of you that read the chapter 14, uh, you were able to stay awake through the entire uh, chapter. I know that it's very tough reading, but uh, we hope that, uh, you know, that you were able to. Um, We'll, we'll talk about it and, and try to make it as simple as we can. I know there's a lot of information in there about depreciation, but we'll, we'll talk about that because it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. So, all right. So as we said, we're going to talk about determine and enter depreciation um, on our 1040 Schedule C. Obviously, we'll talk about uh, entering it uh, when we do our Schedule E in the next chapter. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about things that pertain to clergy um, and what special things happen with their tax return. Uh, we're gonna talk about the self-employment tax, how that works. Um, we're gonna understand the self-employment tax as it relates to clergy or a statutory employee. And then, as I said, uh, we have the speaker here today, but we're gonna talk a little bit about SEPs and SIMPLES and qualified retirement plans. Um, you know, what was, uh, you know, how those work and the uh, how advantageous they can be for somebody that's self-employed, okay? All right, depreciation. 
All right, I realize it's a big word, and if you're not an accountant, it can be a scary word, because depreciation sounds like some hocus pocus, you know, hey, my accountant does depreciation for me, and it sounds like it's something that's special. Um, I'm gonna try to simplify it, and this is the way I teach it. Um, I hope that it works for you. Um, it seems to grasp for my students. Um, it may seem elementary at times, but I just hope that it, it, that it gives you the concept, okay? Um, first of all, depreciation. Like I said, $10 word for a $1 um, item, okay? Basically what I'm saying is depreciation is really nothing more than an expense, okay? Now, it's a special type of expense that we can maybe use, um, but it really is just a line item expense. It falls on our Schedule C under expenses. It's not like it has its own special um, area that, that is different from the Schedule C. If we have something that is depreciable asset, we use it on our Schedule C, okay? But really, it is just nothing more than an expense, all right? Um, as it says there, most types of tangible properties, such as buildings, machinery, vehicles, furniture, and equipment are depreciable. However, land is not. You cannot depreciate land, and, and we'll talk about that when we get into chapter 15 with the rentals, okay? Um, you know, certain intangible property is depreciable. Some intangible property may be amortized, okay? Um, you know, startup patents, copyrights, things like that, basically we're gonna amortize over the future. Uh, don't see a lot of that. Uh, more so people are buying things that are depreciable assets that you have, okay? All right, the next part about depreciation is that, you know, it talks about here that uh, there's some requirements. The taxpayer must own the property. The taxpayer must use the property in business or an income producing activity. Um, if the taxpayer uses the property for business and personal use, the taxpayer can deduct based only on the business use of the portion. Uh, the property must have a determinable useful life of more than one year. Um, just as a side note, you know, we get into, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit too, like I said about it, but computers, they've created kind of a gray area. And what I mean by that is that there's kind of this gray area that we come into play with the fact that, um, you know, we have, um, you know, different, you um, Okay, so we have this, um, um, you know, computer, and it used to be the computers were, you know, thought of, you bought a computer and you had it for a while. Um, but, you know, the whole, you know, the concept of this is, is, is uh, you know, a little bit different than it used to be, okay? Um, you know, computers now, and the IRS actually still calls them data handling equipment, but the computers, really are now treated truly as an expense. Same thing as printers. I mean, I'm sure most of you can attest uh, printers now. You buy a printer and, and uh, it's cheaper to buy a new printer and than it is to buy a cartridge to fill it. So, you know, the handling of things like that has changed. I mean, I realize computers should have more than a uh, uh, one year of useful life, but because of their nature, the IRS has pretty much said that they're expenses. And uh, we can use um, we'll talk about um, de minimis, uh, you know, the, uh, to take that into account uh, for being able to protect, uh, you know, our, our expense, our, excuse our asset and take it as an expense, okay? Um, the other thing that we have here is uh, depreciation. Basically, what we're going to look at is you got to identify the depreciation method, the class life whether it's listed property, whether the taxpayer elects to expense any portion of the asset as a section 179, or if you can take it all in the first year under the special depreciation, uh, the depreciation asset and the property, all these different things, okay, that we talk about. Now, the big thing is, whoops, hold on one second here.
Good question, Marty. Um, all computers or computers such as expensive service still subject to depreciation? I would say that when I refer to computers, most of the time now we talk about somebody having a laptop or a tablet that they use for business. If you are in a business where you have to purchase an expensive server, yes, I would say that that would still go into depreciation. You know, most of the time when I refer to computers, Marty, is that I'm really referring to that laptop, that tablet, you know, even that desktop. You know, if I'm buying a four or $5,000 server to run all the things for my business because the nature of it, yes, that's depreciable, okay? All right, good question, Marty, though. Appreciate that. Um, the next thing that, uh, well, here's the way we're gonna do this, okay? So we're going to take and we're gonna look at this. The way I want you to treat depreciation is I want you to treat it like a pie, okay? And I realize we're, let's see, a little over, yeah, a little over a week from Thanksgiving. And I hope that uh, everybody had some good pies, but we're going to treat it like a pie, a pie that you eat. Okay. So depreciation, I want you to look at it as a pie. If I buy a depreciable asset, that is my pie. Okay. So whatever I paid for that pie, that is my basis. That is the value of that pie. Okay, um, you know, if I had to buy a special pan, different things like that, maybe, you know, uh, uh, I bought a special oven mitt, you know, I'm adding to my basis and adjusting my basis, but this is our pie, okay? Now, with that pie, I gotta decide how I'm going to eat this pie, okay? Do I wanna eat the pie all at once and at first sitting? My special depreciation. I'm going to eat the entire pie right now, okay? Or do I want to do a section 179? I'm going to eat half the pie this year, and then I'm going to save the pie for the next three Thanksgivings and eat a slice of it each of the th next three. Or I'm going to eat 75% of the pie this year and then save the rest for the next two years, you know, depending on its, you know, its, its type of pie. So, I've decided when I'm gonna eat my pie, okay? When I'm gonna to start to eat it. Or am I gonna say, I really like this pie. I'm just gonna take and I'm gonna eat this pie as a little slice every year until it's gone, okay? Now, my useful life, depending on what my pie is. Maybe my pumpkin pie, I can eat for 27 years because it's got a better shelf life, okay? My mincemeat pie, I get to eat it for seven years. My apple pie is five years. So you can see my different type of pies based on my asset, how long can I eat those, all right? So that's really what depreciation is, okay? And then we talk about this makers, we talk about GDS and things like that. Basically what I'm saying with that is, how big is each slice of my pie each year to eat, okay? Makers is telling me how I'm going to cut up my pie. What's the first year slice gonna look like? What's the second year slice gonna look like? You know, again, if I have my pumpkin pie that I get to eat for 27 and a half years, how big is each one of those slices gonna be? If I have my apple pie that I get to eat in seven years, how big a slice is each one of those pieces of pie gonna be? So that's really what depreciation is. It's really just when you're going to use the expense that is the basis or the value of that that asset okay so when we see makers um, we talk about some other things pretty much what we're going to do is is everything that we do as far as um, through the uh, software uh, when we have an asset put into service we're going to do makers and we're going to use gds okay so we're going to have that but as it says as we go along here you know date placed in service very important okay um, when we start to talk about our convention um, it's important to know when it was placed in service. Uh, when we get into rental property, when did I buy my pie? Okay, did I buy my pie in March or did I buy my pie in October? So that makes a difference too. So we have to decide when the item was placed in service. And again, it's placed in service. Um, I always give everybody an example when we start talking about uh, a landlord, okay? He might buy three furnaces because he got them on a scratch and dent closeout. 
but he only has two properties. So he replaces the furnaces and two properties as a third one. He cannot start to depreciate the value of that furnace until it is actually placed in service, until it's actually warming and blowing heat in the house, okay? Otherwise, it's, it's just something that's there. So it's not a depreciable asset until it's placed in service, okay? Uh, when we de determine the property's assets, you know, again, we talked about, uh, you know, the, the basis for that. We have to make sure that we figure out what did it cost us, okay? Uh, what did it cost us to put it in? And what did it cost us to install it? Okay, not just the purchase price. So again, when I talk about depreciating a furnace for a rental, I have to make sure I realize the installation may be part of it. Okay, uh, property class or asset type, very important. Okay, that helps us to determine the recovery period. We'll talk about that a little bit later when we see that some of the tables. All right, now, what Makers and GDS does for us is that it really allows us to kind of front load or use uh, more of the depreciation in earlier years if we choose just to take normal depreciation and don't use the special depreciation or the Section 179. So, you know, this is where versus straight line, where we just kind of take it and slice the pie into equal pieces, you know, we're going to make, like I said, some of the pieces of the pie bigger in the beginning and a little smaller as we go along, okay? So that's where we have the different, uh, you know, the uh, uh, straight line versus the, the GDS method, okay? All right. As I said, we're gonna kind of take a look things, and this is where we have under the general depreciation system, you keep hearing me call it GDS, but uh, under makers and GDS, we have what is our, um, you know, our recovery periods for everything, okay? Okay, all right. So we can see here, I talked about computers, you know, usually you can do five years, uh, like I said, depending on what it is. You know, Marty had a great question about the server. Uh, office machinery, um, again, you know, typewriters, you know, I. I I don't know about you, when was the last time anybody used a typewriter, but uh, we have it. Uh, same thing with calculators, I guess that would include your cell phone. Um, we talk about vehicles, um, we talk about uh, carpets, you know, when we talk about different things, um, as far as, you know, we get down here into our rental properties, um, commercial property is 39 years, uh, if it's not used for residential. So we have all of our years here that shows that our recovery periods, how long do we have to eat our pie, okay? All right, <clears throat> conventions, uh, this is where, you know, we kind of decide for our pie, this is, conventions come into play when we decide when the pie was bought and when do we start to eat it and how much we can eat. Uh, this is, I guess, for lack of a better term, the kind of the diet section, okay? So we can start out with conventions where we have the mid-month. Uh, this is used, and we'll talk about it next chapter in 15, is really used for residential rental property and non-residential real property, okay? Mid-quarter, used if the total depreciable basis of maker's property placed in service during the last three months of the tax year is more than 40% of the total for the entire year. Um, we're going to talk about the example here in a second, but uh, you know that's one that uh, is is kind of off the chart. Um, half year is treats all property as if placed in service at the midpoint of the year. Half year is used for the most property except residential rental property and project subject to mid quarter convention. Okay, so <clears throat> we have here a little example, and it talks about Tom Martin had a dishwasher for $400 that he placed in service in January. He got some used furniture, put it in service in September, and he bought a refrigerator for $800 that was placed in service in October, okay? The total basis of all that property placed in service that year is $1,300, okay? The $800 basis of the refrigerator placed in service during the last three months, which October is, of the tax year exceeds 40% of our total basis, okay? 
Therefore, Tom must use the mid-quarter convention instead of the half-year convention for all three items, okay? So we can see how that was is used. So again, used at the total depreciable basis of maker's property placed in service during the last three months of the tax year is more than 40% of the total for the entire year, okay? So we have to really look when somebody is a rental or maybe they have a business that they're kind of in a startup phase that they may be acquiring a lot of things. We gotta look at when were they bought? When were they placed in service? How much were they? And then we can see which convention we're gonna use. Again, going back to my pie analogy, we're basically saying, when am I gonna eat my pie? Okay, all right, okay. We talked about the conventions. Um, let's see here. Okay. <clears throat> uh, this table will probably refer to quite often. Um, this table coming back, you know, this is where we talk about the different uh, with the makers and the uh, general depreciation system you know, as far as, you know, it helps us with the convention and where that falls into uh, based on, on what we do with it and, and the category that it is in, okay? And then on the next few pages, we have several little tables that apply to based on our, our um, um, you know, recovery periods and the convention that we have selected based on the rules that we just went through. You know, it talks about then in each year what that percentage is. And you know you can see here if I take a look at this one that has my half year, okay. If I take a look at this five year, I can see that you know I'm going to have things depreciated over five years, which actually shows up as six. But you can see that if I add the first three, you know, even the first two, I got fifty-two percent of my depreciation takes place in the first two years, or 52% of me of the pie has been eaten in the first two years, okay? So that's where we can really get something up front. Okay, um, oh, hold on one second. answer a question here. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, so we can see here that we have, um, you know, like I said, this allows us to eat more of our pie in earlier years. You know, I have people in the classroom sessions that are landlords. And when I explain to them that, you know, the recovery period or useful life, if you will, of uh, carpet is five years, they all just start laughing because they said, there's no way carpet lasts five years in a rental. You know, we're replacing it every two or three years. Well, you know, the fact that we can take the, the what we're doing with the, the GDS and the makers and take a lot of that depreciation a little earlier, it really helps us because we're, you know, we're covering and expensing some of that carpet that we may have be taking out of service because it's been destroyed. So, all right, so we have that. Um, there's some of the, again, you know, we got mid-quarter convention, you know, based on when it was placed in service. And again, we have to use mid-quarter if the sum of our, uh, you know, uh, the sum of the basis of what we've placed in service, you know, if, if more than 40% is in the fourth quarter, then we have to use mid-quarter for everything, okay? Um, this is another one that you're going to get yourself very familiar with. Uh, we will come back to it in chapter 15, but this is the uh, residential rental property. You know, if somebody owns a double and they rent half of it and they depreciate it. You know, this is what they will do with that. Um, you know, and, and basically you'll get very familiar with this because a lot of times you will have a client or somebody come in that uh, maybe has not been taking depreciation and should have. 
um, and we'll talk about that again next chapter. But you know, you're going to put in a depreciable asset, and basically, you know, this pie, you needed to know who made the pie, when they made it, and what ingredients were in it before you got it. And so that means prior depreciation. We need to know how much was eaten prior to us eating what portion of it this year. So again, you know, this is a table that you're gonna get very, very familiar with, okay? All right, <clears throat> I have section 179, okay? My section 179 is basically saying, hey, I know what? is an exception to the general uh, where we expensing things, okay? It allows the taxpayer to expense the cost of all or part of a certain qualified property up to a limit in the first year placed in service. Again, these special depreciations, a lot of this, we can take these opportunities, whether it be special depreciation or section 179, in the first year that it is placed in service. So we have to make sure that we, we understand that, okay? And a section 179 basically says, hmm, how hungry am I? How much pie do I want to eat right now? And then that we can say, I think I'll eat 60% of the pie, okay? Now, we may have a dietary limit um, that we can only eat a certain amount. And again, that limitation may say that we can only take a certain amount of that. But again, you know, those are things that we can do. Um, you know, as it talks about here, uh, the total of Section 179 deduction and depreciable deductible for passenger automobile, automobile including a truck or van used in business, play first placed in service in 2018 is $18,000. Um, you know, you got a nice van or truck that you're using for business, that's not much. Um, they have raised that considerably for 2019, taking into the account of the cost of certain vehicles. But, you know, again, that's, that's basically where we're having that depreciation, okay? Um, special depreciation, basically this is saying, hey, I want to eat the entire pie the first year. I am really, really hungry, okay? So, you know, that's where we're going to have that, all right? Now, a little help box down here. It says our pecking order, if you will, on eating pies. We should look at section 179, how much pie do we want to eat? And again, I'm going to talk about this a little bit more when we go through the problem. We're going to actually do the J.P. Barnum problem on the, on the computer. But what we really need to do is make sure that we understand that I can use my depreciation, my Section 179 Special Depreciation Allowance, to really say, okay, I need to talk to the client. We got your income this year. We have a tax bill. If we do some of this depreciation, we can lower that tax liability and lower that tax bill. But I am really mortgaging, the, you hear the old term, mortgaging my future. What I'm basically saying is, hey, you know what? If I take it this year and I take these special depreciation of Section 179 and I have an even better year next year in my business, I'm not going to have as much expense to offset income. I might pay more tax and more self-employment tax. So we got to do that. So, all right. Okay, all right. Okay, so we have, and next we got some differences between section 179 special depreciation. Um, again, great little chart to have, okay? Um, you know, where we do it, again, I'm gonna to kind of talk about it when we get into the, the tax returns and such, but it, it is a very good one to do, okay? All right, so we're gonna do a little bit of an exercise here, okay? Let me just get something open here. So I can see two screens since I don't have a paper book. I got to kind of do this between two computer screens here. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about this depreciation here before we go do a problem. Okay, you know, I got a couple other things to talk about. But we're going to talk about this first. All right. 
So we have a problem here. We have, uh, this is 14A, we're on page, let's see here, 1418. Uh, one of the exercises talk about Jane Smith purchased a desk for her business on June 1st. She paid 3000 for the desk. She uses the desk 100% for her business. She wants to depreciate the desk over the allowable period of time with no special depreciation allowance, okay? It says list the depreciation for 2017, 18, and 19, okay? All right, so we have this, all right? And we basically are gonna kind of go through the steps. You see the nice little IRS loves their little pencil picture. Okay, so it's basically saying we have to do some calculation. All right, so we have maker system part one or line one, part one, line one. Maker system, we're going to do the GDS. Okay, um, we have a desk, office furniture. Our property class is seven years. All right, it was placed into service. Okay, June 1st, 2017. So apparently, it maybe was one of those kits. Uh, what I forget the business name there that they have for them or the company that makes them but we must have had one of those ones and they bought it took it home put it together and sat it so they placed it in service right away uh, we have the recovery period is seven years um, seeing that we really just have the one asset we don't have to worry about anything on the mid quarter so we're going to do that uh, makers half year um, and our depreciation rate well we have three years in play, okay? And it was bought in 2017. Remember, most of the work and the problems and the software and stuff that we're doing, right now we're doing things with stuff for uh, 2018, okay? So 17 would have been the prior year. As you can see there, it says prior year depreciation. So basically what we're gonna be doing here is, We're going to be calculating these three years. Okay, so those are the years that we're going to look at. Okay, all right. Now I have a seven year. Okay, remember I said that you're going to get a little familiar with some of these tables. Okay, I have a seven year, half year. Whoops. Okay, so I have a seven, come back here. There you go. Seven year, half year item that I'm going to be depreciating and it was asking for my rate okay so if I take a look I have my seven year okay and there's my rates so in 17 being the first year I have 14.29 percent okay in the second year I have 24.49 percent and in the third year I have 17.49 percent okay so those are the three years I have 17 prior, uh, 18 current, and 19 future. Okay, so I'm going to be using those three numbers. All right, so if I have those, I'm going to go back to our problem here. So in the first one, my depreciation rate is going to be 14.29%. Okay, if I look at my cost basis, 3000. How much of it used for business? Well, it says that it was all, she says 100% for her business, okay? So we have $3,000. Nothing is gonna be claimed section 179 and no special depreciation, okay? So that means that we're gonna take that 3,000 times 0.1429, which is the, the uh, decimal equivalent of 14.29%, and I'm gonna get $429. So $429 is my depreciation for 2017. The current year, I'm gonna take that 3,000 times the 0.2449, okay, or 24.49%. My second year depreciation, $735. And next year's depreciation will be 525. So you can see how that depreciation works. Now, if I add those three together, okay, I have a $3,000 item. And I've basically taken almost $1,700 of the depreciation. 
well over half in the first three years. Okay, so you can see how it kind of front loads everything for our depreciation. All right, okay. All right. Okay, so we have that. So that talks about depreciation. <clears throat> Excuse me, almost running out of voice today. So that, okay. So that is our depreciation. And again, really it's just a pie. We got a pie. What kind of pie is it? Is it apple? Is it pumpkin? How long is that pie gonna last? Well, that pumpkin pie is 27 and a half or apple, whatever it may be. And then we gotta decide, <clears throat> how are we gonna eat the pie? Makers, GDS. Okay, how many slices? And we talk about that. How big are the slices that we're gonna eat? When are we gonna eat them? Is it gonna be all up front, special depreciation? Half of it up front, and then the rest over little slices over the next you know, useful life? You know, so we have to decide how we're gonna treat that, okay? All right. <clears throat> Self-employment health insurance deduction, okay? Sole proprietors can deduct the cost of health insurance benefits for their employees on Schedule C. However, the cost of insurance coverage for themselves and their families may not be deducted on Schedule C. Self-employed individuals can, however, deduct the amount paid for medical, dental, and long-term qualified insurance for themselves, their spouses, and dependents. The insurance can be cover children who are under 27, even if they aren't are the taxpayer's dependent, okay? So basically, we can take and we can deduct as an adjustment to income, Okay, remember we said that uh, in chapter 14, I would come back to things that had to do with self-employment tax deduction or adjustment to income. It would have to do with the self, uh, health insurance deduction, and it would also have to do with retirement for self-employed. All those things in that chapter about adjustments to income said, see chapter 14, here we go, okay? So I can take that health insurance and I can deduct it, which a lot of times may be advantageous, okay? Um, if I can do it as an adjustment to income, I can lower my taxable income. Sometimes when I take it as an expense, I might not get the same bang for the buck lowering my taxable income as I do take an adjustment. Or the loss on my business because of the way my tax return works may be limited, so I may not be able to totally take that expense this year. Perhaps the adjustment to income is more beneficial for me, okay? All right, so that's what that is. We can take that self-employment, or that uh, healthcare deduction. Uh, self-employment tax, basically what happens, and we had a lot of discussion today because it was a small business seminar for a lot of people that were self-employed, but a lot of it was explanation to everybody that says, hey, when you're self-employed, you have to pay into the system if you want Social Security and Medicare later on. That means that you do not have a W-2 that has the Social Security and the Medicare tax withheld. So you have to do it on your tax return. So that's where self-employment tax comes in. So 15.3%, as you see, that, that self-employment tax on net earnings for 2018 is 15.3%, okay? So that means that 12.4% is Social Security, 2.9% is Medicare tax, all right? So that means that on our tax return, we are paying self-employment tax. We are paying on our net profit, our withholding for the entire year is on our tax return. And this is where a lot of times people with Schedule C's get caught off guard and end up having to pay a, a substantial amount of tax liability at the end of the year because they don't really take into account that there's that extra 15.3. They think about the 10, 12, whatever percent on the income tax, but they don't think about the 15.3% for the self-employment tax, okay? And again, that's just charged on the federal side. Now we saw in the adjustments to income, just like an employer does, you get a credit for half the self-employment tax, okay? All right, so, and we'll see that when we get into the problem and see how that works, okay? Um, let's see, self-employment tax deduction, we just talked about that. Um, clergy, um, I'm gonna put up in the Dropbox um, a copy of the clergy worksheet. Um, basically, clergy, um, 
they don't, on their W-2s, they have income, they may or may not have withholding, but they don't have FICA. So they do self-employment tax on their W-2, okay? Now, a statutory employee may be just the opposite, okay? Statutory employee, the way they're handled is that they are W-2 income with uh, Medicare and um, Social Security withholding, but they don't pay self-employment tax, but they can use a Schedule C to deduct their income. And we'll talk about that again too, okay? Now, the other thing too that comes into play when you're self-employed is SEPs, Simplified Employee Pension Plans, SIMPLES, Savings Incentive Match Plan for Employees, and other qualified things like what they call solo 401ks. You know, so these are things that you can also, you know, make sure that you have, that you have for income, that you can make sure that you have an opportunity as an adjustment to income by contributing to the self-employment tax, um, retirement plans, I should say, okay? So those are a great deal. And the other thing is too, is whereas with the IRA deduction, when we talked about adjustments to income where you're limited to 5,000 or 5,500 or 6,500 or whatever it may be, this one, you know, you could do 25,000 and really help yourself out on income. Okay. All right. So we have that. Um, what's an exercise we have? Okay. All right. So we look good there. Okay. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to take about five minutes while I get uh, the software um, set up here. So we'll take about five minutes, get things set up um, and have that. And then what we'll do on that, okay. And then we're gonna do, let me get back to the workbook here. Um, like I said, we're gonna do JP Barnum is the problem that I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna go through, uh, it's 13.3 it's in your book, okay. Um, page, whoops. In the workbook, it's page 1311, okay? So we're gonna go through that because he has one thing, and then on chapter 14, he had some things in for depreciation, so we're gonna do that, okay? All right, so if you wanna go ahead and get ready, I don't know if you've had a chance to do it, but if you wanna bring up uh, J.P. Barnum uh, for the return, but uh, we'll be right back. this recorded so if you want to come back all right so we're going to take a look like i said we're in the uh workbook chapter 13 13 11 so we're going to kind of go back and do that problem uh so we'll do jp barnum in there and then i will put it in um you know and then like i said we're going to just flow right into 14 uh because we'll have some things that he'll have some assets that he'll purchase and we'll talk about depreciation on it okay all right, so all right, so we're in our software here. Um, we have well, a few bullet points before we get going here. Uh, it says JP filed a 1040 last year. He doesn't itemize, uh, so that means that we're not going to have any um, um, state tax liability because he did not itemize the deductions. Uh, he wants the refund or amount owed electronic. Um, he's going to use, uh, we have information for his 2018. Uh, no EIC credit was disallowed. Um, he had health coverage the entire year. And as it says, he is self-employed. And there's information about his business. He materially participated. Remember, we kind of covered that in Chapter 13. Uh, no payments uh, required for him to issue a 1099, so he did not pay anybody over $600, okay? And basically, he started selling insurance as an independent agent for lifelong insurance. He sells insurance door to door. He does not have any employees, so, okay? So this is basically where he's at, all right? All right, so we're gonna go to his uh, information on 1312, okay? And I'm just gonna wait for the software to come up here. There we go. Okay. So we get a social in there. <clears throat> okay. Oops. There we 
go. Okay, so we have <clears throat> all right, so I have J. Let's see here. I can't use periods. So JP. And I suppose this, uh, I'm surprised he's not working for the Circos, Barnum and Bailey, but uh, I guess he is uh, in the insurance salesman. So, all right, and we have Barnum. All right, we have his address in there on Lexor Lane. And Clarence. And we have his email, he's uh, live long. That's, ins that's his insurance company. Whoops, fat fingers. There we go. Okay. All right. We have a phone number for him. All right. And we have a cell number for him. And we have a date of birth. Again, I always tell you to pay close attention to that date of birth uh, just because it uh, comes into play when we start looking at. Um, the um, um you know when the money's coming out of retirement account and whatnot and as it says here we, he's just going to put in that he was self-employed all right as soon as we hear that schedule c should be coming to mind okay he files single by himself he had no dependents all right uh, he lived in new york all year long and we're going to use his uh m t bank account that's that zero two two all right, and okay, so we have that there. We have <laughs> all right, All right, so and he had health insurance all year long. Okay. And if we take a look, the only document he has on the top of page 13.3, he has a document for uh, non employee compensation from Live Long Insurance Company. So we're going to come back to that in just a second. Okay. But on his return, he's on a Schedule C. So we're going to go to Schedule 1 down to line 12, over to the box, hit F9, we're gonna get our Schedule C, okay? So we have that there. Um, we have that uh, he is in insurance sales, okay? Um, we probably wanna look that up. I'll do that real quick to see what the NAICS number is. And I'm going to say his number is 524210. Okay. And he works for Live Long Insurance. Okay. Don't have to worry about the EI, EIN number for anything. Um, he's doing this from his home. And that address is 5115 Lexer Lane. Oops. Back here. Okay. All right. He is on the cash basis. As we said, he materially anticipates and he did not make any, um, you know, I, he did not do any 1099s. Okay. We know from his 1099. So we're going to hit F9 here. We're going to make a 1099 for his sales. Um, seeing that he's in the insurance business, we really don't have to worry about cost of goods sold because he's not really making anything. He's not making widgets, so he doesn't really have cost of good or inventory. Okay, but we do have, okay, everything there, so we're good there. All right, so we had his items there. 
And we got that 1099 in there. So we go back to our Schedule C, uh, we can see that that's on there. Okay. All right. Now we're going to go back up to that sheet on page 1311. Talks about his business. Well, the first thing is we had some, ex well, had the income. Now we got some expenses. All right. We had advertising, $1,745. Um, legal advice and tax prep, so line 17 with his legal and professional services, he had 550. Uh, cell phone, uh, we could probably put that under utilities. I like to do a cell phone as I like to list it on the other expenses. So we have cell phone, okay? 963. Um, the reason I might list it over here is I can say cell phone and I can do the at sign 100. Okay, so I know that I wrote the entire amount off. All right. Back to page one, we had a business license, which if we go down to 23, we have licenses. Okay, we have printing of forms and brochures. Um, usually I'll put that under supplies. Okay, anything that has to do with items to sell or package my goods. You know, if I made something, merchandise bags, boxes, gift wrap, um, you know, I don't put that under the cost of goods sold supplies uh, because really that's where, you know, the uh, components would be, if you will. But anything that has to do with stuff like that, so anything, catalogs, brochures, stuff like that, I'm going to put that under supplies. Um, postage envelopes and supplies, to me that is office expense. So we're going to put that under the office expense on that side. Okay. We have some insurance. And again, we talked about this. We're going to make the assumption that this is probably like if he's an insurance salesman, it's probably errors and emissions insurance. So uh, we're going to put that under that. We have to make the assumption that it is not health insurance. Um, he did some continuing education. Again, I like to use that other side so that I can put the description there. Okay, so I have continuing education for $1,377. I had a website, again, I like to put that separate so I can see it. I got website 235, okay? All right, so I have that, okay? So I have those things that are there. Um, you could take some of these and if you wanted to put them together, you know, you could, but you know, like I said, I like to use them, you know, on, on the this other expense side. And so I can see a little bit more detail. It gives me a little bit more space to type something in. If I really wanted to put something for detail on these and uh, talk about things, say my continuing education, I could go in here at F9 and I actually could do a scratch pad, okay? And underneath that, I could say continuing education. I could spell it. Maybe I need to go to continuing education, okay? In case anybody's noticed, there's not spell check in the tax wise, okay? So then I could list a whole bunch of things. Maybe I had a trip to Chicago. <clears throat> a trip to Boston. Okay, so those would list out all my different, um, you know, I could use it as a scratch pad to give a little more detail there, okay? All right. Okay, so if I did that, and did my scratch pad method, then I could say my trip, 377 divided by two, all right. And then you can see it totaled for me. And then it took it over, oops. And then it totaled for me on our, uh, you know, Schedule C Part 5, okay? 
And last thing I had down here was he traveled 14,358 miles for business. He used the same vehicle for business since July 13th, 2015. Personal miles were 1,998. He has written documentation, okay? So we had business miles, 14,358. He had some personal miles, okay? Uh, we'll call them other of 1998. And this was a car he placed in service July 13th, 2015. As I've talked about, you know, that number is important because that tells the IRS, hey, if he's taking standard now, he must have started with standard back in 2015. We ask our little due diligence questions, okay? Now, the other thing that we have on this one too is that JP maintains a separate home office. The room has 180 square feet. His house is 1,900 square feet. He has utilities totaling $933 for the entire house. Okay, on this, I'm not going to use the utilities. Okay, I'm just going to do this simplified method. So I'm going to take the total square footage of the house is 1900. Okay, oops, and the home business portion is 180 because that five dollars a square foot that I'm getting is including the utilities. So I do not list the utilities on there. Okay. All right, so we have everything else on there. But, hmm, where did my mileage go? Well, let's go take a look. Oh, yeah, that's right. In order for it to carry over, and again, on purpose, I tried to get this, and it's very important because a lot of times people will forget to do this. It says, check this box to calculate business miles. Well, I got 14,358 at 54 cents, 54 and a half cents, shows zero. Ooh, there it is, 7,825, okay? So we have that on there, all right? Okay, all right. Okay, all right, we'll clean a little bit of this up. Um, we're gonna do no here, but as you can see, he owes some money, all right? So he's gonna have to pay electronically, all right? Um, he is in the Clarence District. <clears throat> No money in foreign bank accounts. And again, on the same thing, he's gonna mail in a check here. All right. Okay, so we have everything there. So we are good, okay? Now, what we're gonna do next so that we can talk about depreciation, um, like I said, these have tandem or, or uh, follow-up I guess would be a better term, uh, problems in chapter 14. So, oops, went right by. Um, on page 14.5, we have a thing that talks about J.P. Barnum again, and it talks about some income that he has, or excuse me, some purchases that he has, okay? Add the following information to the tax return started in problem 13.3. Um, due to the success of JP's insurance sales, he decided to open a storefront. JP purchased a small office building. The cost of the building was $33,000. He closed on June 1st. The building is used solely for his business. JP upgraded the office before the grand opening on July 15th. JP wants to take advantage of Section 179 and or the special depreciation allowance for these items purchased on the same day he closed. Okay. So we're gonna take a look at this, all right? Okay, so we are going to take a look at items that he's going to purchase. He actually purchased a building. We're gonna depreciate that, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this from the perspective of the depreciation. So we're gonna to go to line 13. We're gonna go here 
and we're going to tow F9. We're going to get our depreciation sheet, or I should say form, 4562. All right, so we're going to open that up. Now, this is a form just like I've talked to you about the Schedule B and the Schedule D. Everything goes on these, but you don't type on them, okay? Other than what I'm going to do right now. And this is for his insurance sales, okay? All right. Down here on 6A, it says description of property for accurate computation F9 to worksheet. I like this, the words for accurate computation. So I'm gonna hit an F9. I'm gonna go in and get my asset worksheet. And this is where I'm going to do all my calculation. You can see I have the description. I have my asset type, date placed in service. I have basis. I have business use, 179, special depreciation. I have my method, my recovery period, my convention. Here's all those things that we just talked about, okay? So the first thing is he has a small office building that he purchased, okay? So we're gonna do his office building, okay? And here we're gonna have a menu. You can see the little carrot. I call these things little carrots that we pull down. And we're gonna go through this and we're gonna see real property, non-residential, all right? Okay, and it was placed in service. Now this is the one that's a little bit different, okay? He bought it June 1st, 2018. So you solely use for business. He upgraded the office before the grand opening on July 15th, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put that it was placed in service when the grand opening took place on July 15th, okay? So you can see I have that, okay? All right. Nothing here on the parent property. All right. We have that. Oops. Okay. Now, he bought it for $33,000, but he did some things to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to add to the basis the 33,000, okay? I'm going to add the paint and I'm going to add the sign and the awning because I think that that's capital improvements, okay? My, my land value is going to be 10% of my purchase, so that's 3,300, okay? 100% for business. You can see makers. Um, my recovery period is 39 and a half. My convention is mid-month, so here comes my depreciation, okay? So there's my depreciation as an expense for that, all right? Now, the next thing we have is a office furniture, all right? So I am going to copy up here at the top, copy my asset worksheet. I have some office furniture, okay? If we go in here, we have, let's see here, furnitures and fixtures, non-rental, okay? Uh, again, placed in service July 15th, okay? He paid 5,200, 100% for business. Now, what you can see is all of a sudden we have special depreciation. Do I wanna take it all? All right, and I have section 179. Do I wanna take a portion? Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of wait and see what else there is before I make the decision, okay? So I'm gonna copy my asset worksheet again. And the next item I have is computers and printers, okay? Um, as I said, you know, the IRS perspective, this is called data handling equipment. All right, so we have that. And we have 3367. Oh, I'm sorry. Got ahead of myself here. Hold on one second. Okay. 
again, July 15th, we purchased it for 3367. You can see the data handling equipment, five years. Uh, kind of goes back to that question that Marty had earlier. This is probably more of a server setting. But again, I have special depreciation, and you can see section 179. He owes quite a bit of money. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take his um, furniture, and that's part of my startup. I'm going to put that in as a special depreciation. So you can see I'm taking the 5200. It really took and wiped out. I have no future depreciation. And as you can see over here, considerably lowered his tax bill. Okay, so we have that. On the other one, I want to use a little bit of this next year. So what I think I'll do is I'm going to say no on the special, but I'm going to take $2,000 and use it this year. Eh, let's do, let's do 2,500. Okay. And as you can see, that got his tax bill below 4,000. You know, before he purchased all this stuff, you know, he had a $5,900 tax bill. Okay. So we've done a nice job and we've left some of this, you know, it says here his business is taking off. We want to leave some of these expenses for next year. So that would be a benefit for that, okay? So basically what I'm saying with this one, and this is the one that gets a little bit odd, is that, um, you know, we really, there's really no true perfect right answer for either any of these problems in 14, um, especially when one has special depreciation and uh, section 179, because depending on how we handled it, we could get you know a bunch of different answers. So you really have to just decide how you're going to handle it, okay? All right, so that's depreciation. We're gonna do more depreciation when we do chapter 15 here in a few minutes. So let me get this one in here. Now I have put this up in the Dropbox. I know somebody keeps stealing it out of there. Um, let me double check and see if it's in there any longer. Uh, well, I might be able to put it up in there for you. So I'll probably put this one up in there for you so that you have it to kind of see where those forms are and such, but we'll have the other one that we do here in 15 too. So, okay. All right, let's see here. So we're gonna take another five minutes here um, and then I will be right back. We'll do chapter 15, go through a problem with a rental. Uh, that's going to be our rental income, and we'll try to wrap things up there. Okay. All right. So we'll see everybody back here in about five minutes. Okay. So we're back, and we're going to head into chapter 15. Okay. Um, this chapter, we're going to talk about rent and royalties. Not a lot of content within the chapter, um, you know, as far as uh, what we have on here. Um, you know, it, it's the, the rent, uh, the Schedule E is very similar to what we see. Oops, hold on one second. You're probably thinking, what is he talking about? I missed my share button. Okay, uh, the rent is uh, very much similar to, um, what we see from uh, the Schedule C as far as its content and stuff. We'll go through it uh, when we do the problem that we're gonna do here shortly. So we'll have that, okay, all right. No, nobody's here, okay. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about rent and royalties. Okay. So we have that.
Okay, so rent and royalties, we have that. So we're gonna talk about, if my computer will stop acting up here. Okay, so we're gonna talk about rental, rental income. Rental income can be generated from a variety of sources, uh, personal property, service provided to renters, real estate. Uh, it can be for profit and not for profit. Um, do remember that if we have a <clears throat> rental income is greater than the rental expenses for at least three out of five consecutive years, the IRS presumes that the rental motive is for profit. Um, then, well, the thing is, is that if we are renting below fair market value, say we have a double and we're renting half to our brother, then we uh, basically cannot take the expenses any longer. We show the income on line 21, and we can no longer take the expenses on the Schedule A, okay? Uh, because it used to be under the 2%. So if you're renting below fair market value um, and you're not in, a, in it for profit, or you don't have a profit motive, as the IRS says, then uh, we can no longer take it as expenses. So, okay. All right. Um, the following are considered part of gross rental income. Um, okay, so we have, uh, you know, the all the following are considered gross rental income. Uh, collected rents payments, included late payments and late fees. <clears throat> Advanced rent, any amount received before the period it covers. Um, expenses paid by a tenant in lieu of a rent. Um, the okay so we have that and then we have also we have um you know uh, if the tenant pays the water bill and deducts that amount from the rent payment um if there's property or service received in, instead of rent you know that uh he's well we're in buffalo so you got a tenant that's shoveling the snow uh payment to cancel a lease um, security deposit only if it's kept because the tenant didn't live up to the lease terms. Um, again, you know, this is the case where up front, if we get first and last month's rent and last month's rent is a security deposit, we do not have to declare that last month's rent as income until we actually keep it at the end. If we do not return that, uh, um, till we keep it at the end, if we do not return that deposit. Okay. All right, and then lease with the option to buy. Um, really, that's where somebody is probably going to be buying the rental. Um, say that uh, you know you lived in a double, um, you got married, you moved out, and a new tenant moved in, and you decide you're going to sell it to the guy that had been the other half uh, for all these years. Uh, so he's rent payments might have gone with the lease with the option to buy. Okay, um, qualified business deduction. This one you got to be very careful with when you talk about rental properties because it is something that you know when we talk about rental, we have to be you know careful in the sense of do we take it, do we not take it, um, what is the purpose of taking it? Uh, so we have to be very very careful with this. Okay, um, we have to make sure we keep separate books and records. Um, we have to make sure that for taxable years beginning prior to January first. Um, that we have 250 or more hours of rental services, okay? What that means is, oops, hold on one second here. I'm having trouble getting the chat up here. Give me one second. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> Hold on one second. Oh, there it came. Uh, the interest would be uh, paid when they moved out, okay? All right. So that's when, when you actually cash in the deposits, kind of, if you will, it's held in escrow. So you'd have to wait till that, uh, you know, that, that uh, you actually realize it as income and then have to realize the interest. Okay, <clears throat> all right, so we have that. 
Um, the other thing is, is, is these three requirements. You got to keep separate books for this 20%. Um, you have to have 250 more hours of services provided um, in a rental enterprise. If you live in a double, this is a tough one because you're trying to decide <clears throat> which hours are going towards strictly rental. Did I spend 250 hours? Can I take the QBI? You know, that's a tough one. If you're somebody that has a home, but you own four or five rentals, that's a different ball game. Okay. Um, the taxpayer maintains uh, contemporaneous records, including time reports, logs, or similar documents. Um, you know, that one, you know, all very good one. You have to make sure that there's logs that show the number of hours, especially if you're living in a double and you're trying to do this whole QBI thing. Okay. Uh, rental expenses. Um, as we talked about, you know, those expenses, pretty much those are things that are almost identical to what we see uh, when we saw on the Schedule C. We got advertising, we got mileage, we got cleaning and maintenance. Typically cleaning and maintenance, you know, that would be, you know, snow removal, landscaping, uh, commissions. We have insurance, you know, I can write off now. Um, if I'm living a double, I can write off half my homeowner's insurance. Uh, legal and professional fees, again, you know, legal fees to evict uh, tenants. Uh, professional fees, you know, maybe we have, um, you know, for the accountant or whatever it may be. Management fees, uh, hearing a lot more of uh, people that uh, really don't want to have to deal with the headaches of being a landlord. So they're trying to get out of the, um, you know, the, the tenant uh, being the landlord business, being out of uh, getting out of rental real estate, if, I, if you will. So, you know, that's where, you know, people are hiring management. And if you're doing that, then, you know, you can have, and you're paying somebody else, you can write that off as expenses. Uh, mortgage interest, um, you know, if I have a mortgage on the house, especially if it's a double and I have mortgage on half of it, then, you know, I can write off that interest. Uh, other interest, um, you know, if I have a business credit card, maybe. Um, repairs, again, we have to be careful, repairs versus depreciation. You know, if I'm putting a toilet in, uh, that is a repair. If I'm redoing the bathroom, that is a depreciable and, um, you know, asset. Uh, are depreciable and then I should be depreciating that because I'm doing a capital improvement, okay? Uh, real estate taxes, again, we can write off the taxes. Utilities, uh, most uh, landlords in, this, in, 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 the, um, um, in New York have required to have water, okay? And depreciation, including improvements, all right? You know, anything that we do that is an improvement or betterment or restoring or adapting as it says, you know, those are considered things we can do for depreciation, okay? Uh, last chapter, I talked oops, a little bit about de minimis safe harbor. Um, I'm going to be putting up there the uh, verbiage in the uh, uh, Dropbox for everybody so that they can see that, so that they can understand how that uh, de minimis should be termed and how it should be handled on the tax return. Um, we may touch into it a little bit and we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? But uh, basically, de, uh, de minimis safe harbor election um, is for tangible property that's used, that's greater than one year. Uh, and it's something where we can just take it and use it as an expense, as opposed to putting it maybe under special depreciation as a depreciable asset. So it's a way for us to use something as an expense, not have the IRS, because obviously it's safe harbor. So it's a kind of a get out of jail free, if you will, to keep the IRS from knocking on our door but we can use it uh, to be able to write off something as an expense, as opposed to maybe even doing it as a, uh, uh, like I said, a uh, depreciable asset and doing that special depreciation. Okay, all right. Okay. All right, so we have that. Okay. Uh, depreciation, okay? Again, we've talked about depreciation. I did a little bit when we just did the problem and we're gonna talk about it some more here uh, momentarily, okay? Uh, when we get into another problem, all right? But depreciation, again, you know, we can depreciate that asset. Does it have that useful life greater than a year? And like I said, you know, sometimes with, with uh, rental properties, all the landlords tell me, yeah, I don't know if things last me more than six months. The tenants beat everything up. So, but you know, it, it depends on how it goes with that. Okay. All right. So we have that. 
Okay. All right. Okay. And we talked about special depreciation in the last chapter. Um, again, when we look at makers and we look at GDS, you know, we take a look and, and like I said, this is a tough one. A lot of landlords will say that this is hard, but you know, that's where we have that five years. Okay. So that we have that in there. All right. So we have those. Okay. All right, and then again, you know, I talked about it last chapter. Um, this is a table that you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get to know very well because it's 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 always something that's that's gonna come back because you're gonna have to do the prior depreciation. Okay. Um, condominiums are not gonna use special change. You know, if again, if we have rental property that we're taking from personal use, uh, personal residence, I should say, and we're taking it and start using it as a um, um, as a uh, rental, then we have to make sure that we handle that correctly, okay? Um, you know, renting property too, you know, it, it, depending on if it's a vacation home or not, um, you know, how we handle the, the income as far as the rental um, and how it's worked on, you know, the fair rental days and such, you know, make sure that we understand that. Um, if we have a personal residence, okay, um, and I rent it, uh, my personal, uh, you know, my personal residence and I rent it for less than 15 days, then it's not considered income at all and I don't have to report it on the Schedule E, okay? Uh, most common thing for that, um, I don't know if anybody's aware with uh, Oak Hill up in Rochester, a uh, golf course that they play a lot of uh, the major golf tournaments at. And when those gentlemen come in to play those tournaments, they tend to rent the homes of people that live around the course. And, you know, they may pay them twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 to live, you know, well, I should say some of the higher end guys, but some of them pay twenty five dollars or $30,000 to stay in these homes for a couple of weeks with their entourage and family and, and practice and such. And uh, when those people get that money for the house, it's tax free. That's uh, basically, you know, tax free money that they have. So, um, Let's see here, we have that with the rental, some worksheets. Uh, there is some limits on rental losses. Um, I do have clients uh, because of their W-2 income being higher uh, that uh, when they do the, uh, they may have a loss uh, where they did some renovations or they had rental properties that maybe were empty for a short time. Um, when they get into the um, uh, losses, sometimes those are restricted. Um, or they're they're not able to take those losses, so they might not be able to take them in the year. But those are things that would carry forward and would need to come into play when they go to do uh, the sale of the property and recapture the depreciation. Okay, um, same same things apply about material participating in the rental, so we have to make sure we handle that. Okay, uh, royalties, as it says here, royalties from copyrights, patents, and oil, gas, and mineral properties are taxable as ordinary income. Now, most of the time, um, we will see royalties where you're doing it on the Schedule E because somebody wrote a book, uh, they're receiving a copyright or a patent. Um, the oil, gas, and mineral properties, you don't see those very often where you would put those on a Schedule E. You'll see those more on a K-1, um, you know, so to say that it would be the royalties required on the part one of the Schedule E is probably not true. It's more so that it's reported on the flip side, on the other side there of the, um, um, the um, drawing a blank, on the, um, um, drawing a blank on there. Schedule E, okay, I'm um, trying to think of the part. Part three, where the K-1 goes in, where we have that. So a lot more times that, uh, you know, that comes out of somebody's investments where they have a K-1 because their mutual fund or their brokerage account has, uh, is bought into this mutual fund that has um, gas or oil or whatever mineral, or gold rights, whatever it may be. So sometimes we'll see it on that, okay. All right, uh, we talking about reporting rental income. Again, cash method, when did we collect the rent? 
okay? Uh, we're gonna use a Schedule E. Like I said, we gotta be very careful on the Schedule E, and I'll go through that, uh, but we're gonna talk about that and what goes on there. Um, like I said, it's gonna look a lot like a Schedule C, but we got three properties. It's like a Schedule C with three businesses on it. So we'll kind of work through that, okay? And those were some examples, and that's the quiz for 15. All right, so to get a little more in depth, we're going to go through a problem here. Okay, so we're actually going to do the problem. Uh, we're going to do problem 15.2. All right, let me get my software ready to go here. Okay. All right, like I said, we're gonna do 15.2 in the workbook. It is in the workbook page 1511. So we're gonna go in there and take care of that. Okay, um, we have Thomas and Judah Ziegler. Uh, Thomas and Judah filed a 1040 last year. They weren't able to itemize last year and owe the state an additional 450. They paid it on April 6, 2018. If Thomas and Judith get a refund, they would like to deposit into their checking account. If they owe, they will send a check. Uh, use the information sheet and the forms that followed to complete their 2018 return. Neither Thomas nor Judith was a full-time student in 2018, nor did either receive a retirement plan distribution in the past three years. All right. So it talks about all the different things that we typically see. They had health and coverage. Uh, but they do own and live in a duplex where they rent one side. And it has information about the home. Okay. Uh, the Zigglers also have some W-2 income, have some interest income. Okay. All right. From a couple sources. All right. They had their 1098 and they have a student that is in. Okay. A student that is in school all right so they have that okay all right so let's go ahead and we'll go through this problem okay all right Okay, excuse me one moment. Okay, sorry about that. I thought I was the only one here. I heard a door and didn't want to make sure nobody was sneaking in on me. 
Okay. Okay, so we have, all right. So we are doing the Zigglers here. So we will take care of their return. All right. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have Thomas, um, in initial C, and we have Ziegler, and we have Judith, middle initial M, and Ziegler. Okay. All right. Oops. And we have them living at 404 Woodlawn. Avenue. And they are Ziggy at gmail.com. And we have a phone number for them here. Okay. And again, date of birth important because we have to make sure it's accurate. Should, uh, whoops. As I say, it should be accurate. There we go. Why am I having trouble with this? Zero, eight, zero, eight, six, zero. Okay, there we go. To make sure, in this case, uh, as we see Thomas, you know, 58, you know, he's approaching that magic 59 and a half. And if we look at his spouse, she is 59. Okay, so we have her, all right. Okay. All right, we have their occupations. He is working as a welder, um, maybe has union dues. We'll have to think about that for the uh, state side. And we have the spouse as a registered nurse, okay? They are doing married filing joint. Um, as I talked about, we have a couple dependents because we did have an education credit there. So we have Herman. And we have his date of birth. And I like, nope, both kids are going to be born on the same day. Okay. Okay, we have that. And then we have Mandy. And like I said, they were born on the same day, years apart, but on the same day. Um, she is no longer a child tax credit. She's turned 17 this year, but uh, they have her on the return there. She's probably a senior in high school. Okay, like I said, I always check the EIC. Uh, lived in New York all year long. As I said, we have bank account information for handling their refund or balance due. <clears throat> okay. And we have bank information there. We have, all right. Okay. 
And like I said, I always, for that pen, I just use that zip code. Um, it's because it's a five digit. Don't worry about the driver's license. We'll pick up on that later. And okay, we have that. Okay. And they were covered by health insurance. Okay. Now, as I said, they have a couple W-2s here. So we're gonna go get our tree on the left, get our W-2, um, get that in there. We have, he's working for electric. Oops. He is working for electric furnace. Okay. All right, and we had some New York State disability, whoops. And we had that there. Um, as we can see, there's some things in box 12. He had some contributions to some retirement. And the DD code, he had uh, health insurance. We have to make sure on 13 that we say that he was covered by health insurance. And then we have the state withholding. Okay, so we have that. Um, we have, all right, another W, no, we don't have another W-2. We had some interest statements, okay? So we have some interest income. So we're gonna go up to, oops, up to our schedule two. Go to, or, excuse me, 1040 page two. Go up to line two, we're gonna get our schedule B, which is for the interest. Nothing goes on the B. Uh, we're going to get that little worksheet and go inside there. We have here that this payer was First National Bank. Uh, we had interest income in box one, uh, 1456. Um, I like to separate out just uh, for explanations purposes that we had bonds, 1899.88. All right, and we have a state adjustment because these bonds are not taxable on the state. And then we also had federal tax withheld. So we have to make sure we get that in there, okay? Uh, next one down, we had some more interest income from First National Bank, okay, uh, $623, so we have that. Now, last thing we have is we had some mortgage interest. We'll come back to that because we're gonna use that on the rental but we did have somebody in school, okay? So we're gonna go to schedule three, line 50, pick up our education credit, and we're gonna go in there for that. And as it shows here, we had Herman was going to Buffalo State. And that was his social. Okay, whoop. Buffalo State College. Okay, whoops. And that is 1300. We have Elmwood Avenue. All right, 14217 on that one. And we have the EIN number for Elmwood. Okay. And as it so shows on here, uh, his age was 22, and we see box nine is checked that he's a graduate student. So we're basically gonna say that he's already taken his American opportunity. We're gonna go down here, and now I know from my classroom sessions, we gotta be very careful with this, and this is the fact that um, um, we have to find out that uh, we gotta make sure that we have, um, um, the um that we use the correct number okay um my classroom sessions were were having instances where they were trying to use the four thousand as a limit because that's what the american opportunity credit is um, we have to remember that yes there is a limit 
but it's 20%. Um, the credit is maximized at 2,000. That is not the limit of what you can enter. So make sure that you're entering. In this case, we have in box one, $10,500. And in box five, we got $6,000, okay? So we're gonna hit F5. We're gonna take 10,500 and we're gonna subtract 6,000, okay? We got 4,500 in there and that's what our credit's gonna be on that, okay? All right, now we're gonna go back up to our bullet points. We have them, oh, whoops, we got one other thing to take care of and I about forgot it. Um, first bullet point, they weren't able to item as last year and they owed a sta the state an additional $450, okay? Couple options with this. We can go in here and this is what I like to do. Income tax line 5A, where we have that, light it up, hit F9, federal state tax paid, okay? Under the bottom section here, we have New York state and or local balance due from the previous years. We're gonna put our $450 in there, okay? So we have that, all right? Uh, the other thing I want you to know on the 8880 over here, we have a potential credit, okay? So we're not gonna put that in there, all right? Because that gets us an extra $200, all right? Because of the contributions to the retirement and the level of income, uh, married filing joint, their income AGI right now is below 63,000, okay? All right, <clears throat> we have a rental. We're gonna go to schedule one. Uh, remember line 12 is where we did the schedule C. We're gonna go to line 17. We're gonna hit F9. We're gonna go to our schedule E. All right, we have <clears throat> that they have a duplex that they live in half of it, okay? So we have to remember that their address there was 404 Woodlawn, okay? So we have 404 Woodlawn Avenue, okay? And <clears throat> Let me see that zip code, 14208, okay? So we have that. Um, if we have to choose, this little thing says type, we got two asterisk, we can follow up this up here. It says allowable codes right up here. Single family residence, multifamily has a bunch of different things. Here's our royalties on the six. In this case, we have it being a multifamily because it's a duplex and it was available as it says there for rent the entire year. Okay, now rents received. Um, the tenants didn't pay December until January 10th, 2019. So that means we had 11 months at $880. Okay, so whoops. 11 months at $880. Okay, why am I having such a hard time with that? There we go, okay? So we had that, all right? So they're missing one month's rent. Oops, I'm sorry. There we go, okay? Um, we had expenses. We had homeowner's insurance, which was 543. So we go to line nine. Again, I can use my calculator on these because they lived in half of it. So we're gonna take that and we got 543 and we're gonna divide it by two, okay? So we have that. Now I'm gonna go back up. They purchased a duplex on June 1st, 2003. So we're gonna be able to depreciate this. So I'm gonna hit F9. Now, the one thing I want you to stay away from and do not use is you're going to see every time you open this and you think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread, but it's not, that little thing that says rental part year rental ownership worksheet. Do not use these, they do not work well. And plus they create a headache for the person for the next year. And they're also difficult to work with when we go to sell it, should we sell the property, okay? All right, so we're gonna hit F9 in here. We're gonna get our 4562. And I like to do on these is I like to use the address as my header for the um, 4562. Again, I'm gonna go in here, hit F9, 
I'm going to pick up my asset worksheet and we're going to depreciate the building. Okay. And this is a, uh, as we go down here, remember we had uh, rental, real property, non residential on the other one for the office building for Mr. Barnum. This one we have a residential rental. Okay. We had it placed in service June 1st, 2003. Okay. Now, since there's three columns on the Schedule E, we're going to use the A, B, and C. We're going to use those three columns and we have to choose the property that it relates to. Next question talks about is it residential rental? And then we have our basis, okay? We can put it in there at 82. Um, as it says, our land value, we gotta take that back out to 8,200. And then here for business use, because we live in it, we're gonna take 50%, okay? Now, remember that real property residential rentals mid-month, and the other thing that we have that's red on there that uh, I'm going to actually assign for homework is that you're going to have to figure out prior depreciation. And that's a lot of fun. I'll try to put something on the, um, the um, Dropbox that'll have calculations of that. I'll put the number in there. I'll try to upload the problem. Okay. Um, this was 15, just making a note here, 15.2. Okay. So we'll have that. So that'll be something that we can help with on that. Okay. All right. So we have that in there. Uh, we're going to go back to our Schedule E. All right. We have it. Um, next thing down, cleaning supplies for the rental. So we'll put that under cleaning. Okay. Uh, window repair, tenant kitchen. So again, that can all go towards the tenant. Okay. Uh, user fee, garbage and water, 454 every six months. For things like that, I like to use, instead of the utilities line, I like to use the other line. What that is, is it's a nice little uh, sheet there that has a little bit more descriptive area and we have the three columns. So I can put my user fee on there, okay? And in this case, 454 every six months, but we're taking half of it, so that are known as 454, okay? Um, we're going back to our Schedule E, page one. We have paint for our son's bedroom, all right? So that paint would be, oh, that's my son. That's not for the tenant, I cannot deduct that. Exterminator, ants around the entire house. Again, I like to use that other expense worksheet and put that, that exterminator in there, okay? All right, so we have that and $160 there. We had legal fees um, for the rental. Okay, so we're gonna put that on there. Must have had to evict somebody or something, but we have legal fees for the rental. All right, now, next thing down here, we have a couple things that they did to the property. We had a roof was replaced and we also had the driveway was replaced both things that we can consider improvements that we can depreciate. So I'm gonna go over and grab my asset worksheet from the first one, and then I'm gonna hit copy, and I have roof, okay? And on that roof, we're gonna use <clears throat> leasehold improvements for the residential. We have, it was done 08092008. Again, we have to choose our parent property. In this case, we only have one. This was for a residential rental. The improvement was 8435, okay? Again, we use mid-month. And again, we're gonna have to calculate some prior depreciation, okay? As we can note on this though, no special depreciation, no section 179, because it does not qualify, okay? All right? And then the last thing we have is one more thing. We have a, oh, the roof. I wonder if the roof is over my half or the tenant's half. Hmm, I bet we have to share it because it's a duplex. All right, so we're gonna have to make sure that we put in that we share the roof. So we'll have to do the 50%.
Okay. So we have the roof. And again, I've had people that uh, tried to argue with me. Well, I live in a double. I live in the lower. My tenant lives in the upper. The roof's over his half. No, the roof's over the entire building. I realize that's a try to be a good argument, but it's not going to work. Okay. Then we have our ass other asset worksheet. We have a driveway. Oops, get in there. Okay. And again, sometimes people will think, hmm, that must be 27 and a half. If we remember from our table though, that is actually 15 years. So that is land improvements. And as you can see, when I go down here to line four in the bottom, my recovery period, I got 15 years, okay? So I have that placed in service 9-10-2015. I have my parent property. Again, it is a residential rental. Um, I have that I spent $5,766. And again, shared driveway, 50% mid-month. You know, we got to do that prior depreciation, not eligible for any special or anything else on there. Okay. All right. So I have everything there. Okay. Now, the only thing I'm missing is I need to go down and I need to get off my 1098. Okay is my mortgage interest and my property taxes, okay? Mortgage interest is on there, but again, I live in half of it, so I got 1901 divided by two, okay? And then I have my taxes, which are 6654.22 divided by two, because I live in half, okay? All right, so I have those on there, and it should be everything on there. Okay, so we have everything on there. So you can see the rental works a lot like a Schedule C. We still do depreciation and everything like that. Um, we'd have a few things to clean up on here on the left, but uh, you know, to get rid of the last of things, but we're in good shape. Uh, the New York 272, because as grad school, we're not going to be eligible for any state graduation, or excuse me, state credit on there. So, all right, so that's the way rentals work. Okay. All right, so we have those, and we'll save this one. We'll put a couple of these up there in the Dropbox. I'll go ahead and put the two problems we did today up there in the Dropbox so we have those, okay? All right, so we covered 14 and 15 today. Like I said, we did quite a bit. Um, some of it was just expanding on what we'd already done, did a couple of problems. Um, not too bad. Uh, we're kind of at that point that, uh, you know, we're adding a little bit of stuff. Um, don't want to get bogged down in depreciation. Like I said, use the pie rule. Uh, make sure you're comfortable with that. Okay. All right. Now, since I got you guys here with me, does anybody have any questions? Specific to anything that we've covered? Nothing here. Checking the text to see if anything came in from anybody. Don't see anything there. Okay. Uh, what are the hours we can take the exam next week? I will send those out. Pretty much we're going to use... Uh, um, the hours that the computer lab is uh, open, which has been nine to five. Um, the only thing I got to check on, I'll send it out tomorrow um, with some times to, that people can sign up and let me know. The only one I'm concerned about, I'm not sure, because Wednesday used to be a day where we had our advanced class and our enrolled agent class. So I want to make sure to see if Wednesday's open, but it might be pretty much, uh, you know, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Um, I am not here late on um, uh, Tuesdays or Thursdays, because I teach. 
um, up in Lockport, but uh, there are other nights. So if somebody needs to do something after six, or excuse me, after five uh, later to take the exam, I am willing to stay late at night. So I will help somebody out with that. So, okay. Um, the other thing too is I should have, um, you know, uh, received if I sent it out to you, if you completed the, the written and the computer exam and got those to me and your grades were sufficient, um, I would have dispersed to you a uh, working, uh, uh, do you want a work letter? I need to make sure that those are back from everybody. Um, I believe everybody that uh, is here with me today, um, you've gotten yours in, but anybody that listens to this that was not able to be there, uh, make sure you get those back to me as soon as possible. Um, you know, that would be the great thing. So, um, nope, you can't do uh, rental property as business. Well, it depends. Um, there's a lot of variables in there, Stephen, that we could probably spend the next hour working on. Um, but, you know, when you have uh, that you are in a rental, um, if it's truly a rental, then it goes on a Schedule E. Now, if you have um, such that you are managing, um, where you're, you know, you're not really owning the rentals, but you're managing rentals, then yes, that would go on the Schedule C. But income from the rental itself is on a Schedule E. Now, some of the things can be handled even more different if we have our rentals set up in an LLC, or we've decided to make it a S Corp where it's owned by an entity and not strictly ourselves. So, um, like I said, we could probably spend the next 45 minutes to an hour uh, discussing all the options, but you know, rental property, Schedule E, that's all you need to know right now. Um, we're not really gonna get into any other entities. Um, you know, Schedule Cs, you would do um, if somebody had flips that they were not renting. So they were buying houses and flipping them and not living in them, then that goes on a Schedule C because that is a business as opposed to a rental, okay? All right, okay. All right, everybody, thank you again for joining me today. I apologize about the late start uh, with wrapping up our seminar, and I also apologize um, you know, uh, uh, for any of the interruptions and stuff today. Um, and again, thank you for those that could make it to this afternoon. It really helped out with me being able to participate uh, this morning's seminar. I, I even learned some things myself as I was listening to everything. So that was great, but uh, I do appreciate everybody's efforts on that. Um, if anybody has any questions, like I said, I don't know if I get to it today. Um, I have to get out uh, so I can head to my grandson's birthday party. I don't wanna miss that monster truck birthday party. So I will head out for that. And I don't know if I get everything um, in uh, or out tonight as far as uh, the recordings and such, but I will make sure they are out tomorrow morning. Um, and with the available times for the um, uh, coming in to take the exam. So, all right, so that's all we have for today. Um, again, thank you to everybody. And uh, if I don't see you during the week for the exam, we'll see everybody next Saturday.